It's a threat that's been made not once, not twice, but repeatedly from the Russian side since the beginning of the invasion. We're sitting here on day 62 now, well into the third month of this conflict. And now Russia's foreign minister, who spoke exclusively to India today just a few days ago, now says the world must not underestimate the threat of nuclear war and has also explicitly pointed out that what's happening in Ukraine right now could easily inflate into World War III. Take a look. Risk of a nuclear war is very, very significant and should not be underestimated, warns Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. As the Russia-Ukraine war enters day 62 with Ukraine, successfully stalling the Russian forces for over two months with NATO weapons, the Russian foreign minister accused NATO of engaging in a proxy war, supplying sophisticated weapons to Ukraine. Lavrov, in an interview to the Russian state television, accused the United States of trying to weaken Russia. I would not want to elevate those risks artificially. Many would like that. The danger is serious, real, insists the Russian foreign minister. This, of course, is in stark contrast with the Russian foreign minister who had told India today in an exclusive interview in Moscow where he accused the West of raising the nuclear boogie. As a P5 member, as a nuclear power, will nuclear be an option at all? Is it on the table at all? Uh, when uh, the Soviet Union and the United States in 1987, Gorbachev and Reagan uh, decided that they have special responsibility for peace on this planet. They signed a solemn declaration that there could be no winners in a nuclear war and therefore nuclear war must never be launched. Russian President Vladimir Putin had reviewed a military exercise of Russian strategic defense forces seen as a signal to the West not to get involved in Ukraine. NATO supplying Javelin anti-tank guided missiles, S-300 missile defense shield, switchblade drones, long-range artillery and ammunition has been described by Lavrov as provocative measures calculated to prolong the conflict rather than end it. NATO, in a sense, is engaging in a war with Russia through a proxy and is arming that proxy. War means war. Lavrov was quoted saying, Moscow's assessment is that Washington, D.C. wants to see Russia weakened and the nuclear threat is aimed not only to dissuade NATO from arming Ukraine, but also to prevent Finland and Sweden from joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The conversations again about Finland and Sweden joining or becoming a member of the NATO, there is conversation in Russia and clear message to the world that should there be an existential crisis to Russia, they would be looking at nuclear. But that only if their existence is under threat. In Moscow, Gita Mohan for India Today. Now, there are no formal definitions of what constitutes a world war, but there are some reasonable criteria. So let's see if what's happening in Ukraine actually fits those criteria at this point of time. What constitutes a, a, you know, a world war, really? There have only really been two world wars, World War I, World War II, both in the 20th century. But let's look at criteria one right now of what constitutes, in our belief, a world war. One, it must invo involve all the major powers. We do know what's happening in Ukraine involves... OK, let's go back to that first slide, to the first slide. Let's go back to the first slide. You've got the US, you've got France, you've got Britain, uh, Britain, you've got Germany, you've got Russia and China helping Russia as well. All the major powers of the world are involved. So criteria one has definitely been met. Now let's go to criteria two for what constitutes a world war. It must involve large parts of the world. In this case, the theater of the war is only in Ukraine. There's no combat activity happening anywhere else. So in that sense, in criteria two, it does not meet that criteria. Criteria number three, it must involve multiple theaters of combat. Once again, the fighting is only happening in Ukraine. It's not happening in other parts of the world. Like, for example, during World War II, there was stuff happening in North Africa, in Japan, etc. Here, it's only happening in Ukraine, so it doesn't meet that World War criteria. Criteria number four is must involve economic sanctions, blockades, 
between several countries. You've got the biggest ones happening between the United States and Russia. There are, of course, several other sanctionings happening between Europe and Russia as well, but we won't get into that. But this criteria is also met because the two world's biggest superpowers have sanctions going on between them. Criteria number five must include closure of airspace. Very, very true. It definitely meets the criteria. UK, EU, Canada, US all have shut off their airspace to Russia. So airspace restrictions and punitive action, that criteria for a world war has also been met. And finally, heightened nuclear readiness. This has definitely been met, including in the story that we just broke from the Russia first putting its uh, nuclear arsenal on high alert and then followed by UK, France and the United States. So all of these countries have put their... Uh, uh, their uh, nuclear arsenals on high alert. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. We can't really call it a world war. But the Russian foreign minister now says World War III is what this conflict could actually become. Right in the middle of this entire crisis, when the levels of combat and violence have been increasing, the destruction is huge, global tensions are at an all-time high, this is what President Putin has basically tested. It's called the Sarmat. It's one of Russia's most capable and highly anticipated nuclear long-range missiles. It's a ballistic intercontinental range missile. But why has he done it now? when it has all the potency to ratchet up nuclear temperatures and tensions once again. What is the signal going out? Take a look at this report. On 20th April, Russia test launched its intercontinental ballistic missile, Sarmat, believed to be adding more power to its nuclear arsenal. U.S. Congressional Research Service claimed that Russia is expected to deploy Sarmat with 10 or more warheads on each missile. Dear comrades, I congratulate you on the successful test firing of the Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. This is a big significant event in the development of advanced weapon systems for the Russian army. The new system has the highest tactical and technical characteristics and is able to overcome all the missile defense capabilities. The heavy intercontinental ballistic missile Sarmat has been under development for years now. Its test launch at this crucial juncture of war is an ominous sign and the Russian president is well aware of it. It will have no equivalents in the world for a long time. This truly unique weapon will enhance the military potential of our armed forces and will reliably provide security for Russia from external threats and will make others who, in the heat of frantic, aggressive rhetoric, try to threaten our country, think twice. The intercontinental ballistic missile was test launched from Blesetsk in northwest Russia and hit targets in the Kamchatka Peninsula in the Far East. Bureau report, India Today. Okay, let's tell you a little bit about the Sarmat, which is the newest missile that President Putin's forces have just tested. It's an intercontinental range ballistic missile, which means ranges in excess of eight, 9,000 kilometers. It has a range of about uh, 11, uh, over 11,000 kilometers and has a weight of about 308 tons. Huge, huge missile. This huge missile has just been tested. It's an intercontinental range ballistic missile. It's a three-stage liquid-fueled ballistic missile. And remember, it adds to the current arsenal of intercontinental range ballistic missiles that Russia already has. It is about 35.3 meters long, 3 meters in diameter. That's pretty much what the Sarmat missile that has been tested uh, actually looks like at this point. It can carry more than 10 warheads. It is said to be technically superior to any intercontinental nuclear missile uh, you know, that has been there. It has faced some delays. It's been in development since the 2000s. Uh, this test was expected, but for it to happen at this point of time is what has raised a lot of nuclear eyebrows all around the world. And most importantly, while testing this missile, the Kremlin has said this is not only our most technologically advanced nuclear weapon, it's also something that will give our enemies food for thought. So dangerous 
provocative language being used along with a test of a weapon system at a time when tensions are at an all-time high. A great deal of messaging taken place. But remember, is nuclear war possible or is it too far-fetched? One of the world's most respected Russia watchers, a Harvard professor named Dr. Rab R R R Ravi Abdelal, has spoken exclusively to India today's Rahul Kaval, and he had this very ominous prediction to make. Tactical nuclear strike is a possibility. Words that will echo through war rooms across the world. Not just random analysis, but the words of one of the world's most respected Russia watchers. Engage with the world. Howard Professor Ravi Abdelal, director of Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. An academic whose views on the world's biggest story is one of the most sought after. Is not about Russia versus Ukraine, but about Russia versus the West. And for that logic, we'd need to think about what are the ways in which Russia and NATO could come into direct conflict that could lead to a nuclear exchange between the great powers as opposed to a single tactical nuclear strike in Ukraine. Professor Abdullah's world-exclusive interaction with India today adds ominous urgency to the aura of nuclear threat surrounding Russia and Ukraine. His words come just a day after Russia's foreign minister, in his only interview so far in the war, played down the nuclear threat that has emanated consistently from Moscow. The Russian military has these hypersonic missiles, which are good at evading missile defense systems. It has thermobaric weapons, the so-called vacuum bombs. As far as we know from the outside, the Russian military has used one of each, probably to demonstrate what they can do, but have not yet escalated to the widespread use of these really terrifying weapons, much less the possibility of a tactical nuclear strike on the territory of Ukraine. There could be no winners in a nuclear war, and therefore, nuclear war must never be launched. Obviously, the Professor Abdullah is the second top tier American academic to highlight the nuclear threat emerging from Russia. Last month, Princeton University's Dr. Zia Mia echoed the fear. This is part of the script of the nuclear age. So nuclear weapon states say this because they can, because they have nuclear weapons. Away from the nuclear threat, Professor Abdelal also sees Ukraine's current weapon levels as only enough to keep its head above water. The Ukrainian military and indeed the Ukrainian civilians who have been waging this counteroffensive against the Russians have perhaps been armed enough to achieve a kind of stalemate though not enough to win the war. But the longer the stalemate lasts, the more likely there will be escalation on the Russian side, using weapons that they have mostly not yet used in ways that will be difficult for the rest of us to watch and horrible for the Ukrainians to endure. With only some indicators on where the war is headed and what the end game is, the Harvard guru makes a pronouncement that provides shape to the next steps. That there's little chance of the war winding down soon. President Putin has gambled his historical legacy on this war, which means that there is no backing down. There will be no end to this war until the Russian president feels that he can narrate some sort of achievement, both militarily and politically, from the war. On India Today, the most sought-after academic and strategic minds provide their views first, allowing us and you, the viewer, navigate this emerging conflict. With Rahul Kawal in Boston, Bureau Report, India Today. Now, after back-to-back -back nuclear dares from Russia, a kind of rollback saying nuclear war is off the table, and now this sudden testing of the most 
capable Russian nuclear missile amidst the highest levels of tension in Ukraine. Here's a report telling you why the world is actually not very sure about what comes next and why it has reason to be worried. Unending invasion war, weeks of savage battle, countless deaths, cities in complete ruin. But no massive win to show on the ground for Russian President Vladimir Putin. Oh my God. Amidst the fierce fight back by Ukraine and biting Western sanctions, Ominous signs for the world have emerged. Putin has resorted to the Brahmastra in his arsenal. The massive Russian stockpile of nuclear weapons. Openly threatening a no-holds-barred nuclear war. Refusing to rule out the use of nuclear weapons if there is an existential threat to Russia. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had earlier warned that any Third World War would be nuclear and destructive. A threat repeated by the Kremlin with chilling resonance. The outcome of the operation, uh, of course, is not a reason for usage of a nuclear weapon. We have a security concept that very clearly states that only uh, when, when there is a threat for existence of, of the state in our country, we can uh, use and we will actually use nuclear weapons to eliminate the threat for the existence of our country. Let me assure you, a responsible member of the international community committed to its obligations to non-profilation of weapons of mass destruction. Russia is taking every possible measure to prevent Ukraine from getting nuclear weapons and respective technologies. The nuclear saber rattling is one of many that Russia has openly indulged in. Just days into the Ukraine invasion, Vladimir Putin had put nuclear deterrent forces on high alert as a chilling warning to NATO and the West. Dear colleagues, as you can see, not only Western countries take unfriendly measures against our country. In the economic dimension, I mean the illegal sanctions that everyone knows about very well. But the top officials of leading NATO countries allow themselves to make aggressive statements with regard to our country. That is why I ordered Defence Minister and Chief of General Staff to put Russian Army deterrence forces on high alert. It has now emerged that Russia had even dispatched its nuclear ballistic missile submarines into the North Atlantic as the war raged in Ukraine. After their deterrent patrol, the submarines were quietly pulled back by the Kremlin. The West fears that Russia, suffering massive reverses in Ukraine's war theater, could resort to using tactical nuclear weapons, which are of a small yield but can devastate an entire city. In a bid to escalate the war and force Ukraine to agree to its terms on the negotiations table. Allies agreed to supply equipment uh, to help Ukraine protect against uh, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear threats. Uh, this could include um, uh, detection uh, equipment, uh, protection and medical support, as well as training uh, for the uh, contamination and crisis management. We are also enhancing allies' uh, preparedness and readiness for chemical and biological and nuclear threats. A calculated nuclear gambit or plain brinkmanship to turn the tide in a war that has simply not gone Russia's way as expected. Whatever it may be, the Ukraine war triggering nuclear moves comes as a massive alarm bell for the entire world. Russia during this crisis has made not one, not two, but three nuclear threats. They've even operationalized and put on high alert their nuclear arsenal. 
Here's a look at the number of nuclear warheads that each country is known to have just now because it's all about the numbers. Russia is the country with the largest nuclear arsenal with over 6,200 nuclear warheads at this point of time. The United States has just a few, uh, somewhat fewer warheads, no less powerful at 5,550. And then there's China, which has 350 nuclear weapons at this time. For comparison, the only two NATO countries, other two NATO countries in Europe that have nuclear weapons are, of course, France, which has 290. You've got UK, which has 225. Pakistan has 164. Remember, in the nuclear world, these numbers are enough to destroy the world many times over. India has 156 nuclear weapons. Israel has about 90. North Korea, we think, has between 40 and 50 nuclear weapons. So starting with the Russian nuclear ballistic missile submarines, like we said, is the Bore class of submarine. Uh, there are 10 that are supposed to be in service and their main weapon is the Bulava intercontinental submarine launched ballistic missile. The Bore class is the mainstay. Moving on to the United States, they have a fleet of 14 Ohio class SSBMs or ballistic missile nuclear powered submarines. The Trident ICBM is the primary nuclear weapon on those submarines. Then you've got China which has a fleet of six Jin class uh, uh, nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines uh, which have the Julang 2 missile which is their major primary deterrent weapon. Moving on to France, it has the Triumphant class, uh, a fleet of four such submarines, nuclear ballistic missile submarines, uh, where uh, they've got their own weapon system on board, those as well. Those also go out on strategic deterrent patrols. Moving on to India, of course, we've got two Arihant class uh, nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines, the Agni series of missiles and their derivatives, the K-15 and the K-4 missiles are our nuclear capable submarine launched missiles on that particular submarine. And finally, the United Kingdom has the Vanguard class, a fleet of four nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines where the US built Trident missiles are the primary nuclear weapon on board those submarines. So many, many nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines already in the world. Nuclear powers also have land-launched ballistic missiles designed for intercontinental range nuclear delivery. Russia depends on its arsenal of Topol M long-range ballistic missiles designed for nuclear strike out to ranges of 11,000 kilometers. The US has Minuteman III ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear warheads out to 13,000 kilometers. China's Dongfeng series of ballistic missiles have large ranges to deliver nuclear warheads, including the Dongfeng 31, capable of nuclear strike out to over 11,000 kilometers. And remember, the land leg of India's own nuclear command has the Agni 5 missile, capable of carrying out a nuclear attack out to 5,500 kilometers or more. All of these long-range missile systems are operational and ready to be deployed at short notice. And in response to Russia's nuclear signaling, are in fact on reciprocal high alert. And apart from land and sea, there's always the aerial option for nuclear bombing, very much like the first and only nuclear attack over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. The aerial option exists to this day with nuclear powers. Russia, which has been using the Kinjal air-launched ballistic missile in Ukraine, has been fitting them with non-nuclear warheads. But the missile is capable of nuclear strike as well and is part of Russia's strategic arsenal with the missile deployable from MiG-31 fighters as well as Tu-22 bombers. The United States nuclear air delivery platforms include the world's first stealth bomber, the B-2 Spirit, an enigmatic airplane capable of penetrating highly contested airspace for strategic bombing, and the monster B-52 Stratofortress, an eight-engine behemoth that's seen half a century of nuclear readiness. What we're telling you 
is that the world has enough nuclear weapons and delivery systems to doom us into non-existence in a flash of a second. Weapons that were developed during the Second World War and then proliferated as a method to keep the post-war peace. While they haven't stopped wars and destruction, they've certainly ensured there hasn't been another nuclear exchange after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But with the world's biggest powers turning up the nuclear heat, it's only natural that the world is on edge. Bureau Report, India Today.